Happy birthday to you. No. The year 2003 pleased us with the release of a masterpiece about stomach of Steven Seagal, a movie called Belly of the Beast. The title sounds intriguing, as during that time this belly was probably the most notable part among action movie heroes. Let's cross our fingers in the hope that this time Steven will delight us with something special. So the movie begins in 1994. Seated in Thailand, he and his friend Byron Mann engage in a friendly conversation with some individuals. Each person seems to speak about his own topic and doesn't listen to the other. But the conversation proceeds in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Until at some point Steven clumsily moves his hand in his confusion, Byron Mann smashes through a cardboard door and after that through the clay window. After falling from the second floor, he runs towards a cart with water. Oh! The puddles on the road blind the guy and he starts shooting at a mother who decided to get some fresh air amidst the crossfire. Byron decides to flex his vocal cords and give his lungs some workout. We fast forward to present day Hawaii. A slender and muscular ninja stealthily climbs the walls of a mansion filled with blind and deaf guards. A grown up and bloated Steven Seagal appears out of nowhere and sneaks into the house to gracefully somersault in the middle of an empty room. The ninja runs in the light in front of everyone, but luckily for him, guards are too busy staring at a naked swimmer. He easily cracks the safe code on his third attempt. And then he slides on his own sweat, demonstrating just how much the filmmakers of Superman missed out by not casting him. Gasping for breath and exhausted from watching his stunt double do all the work, Seagal instinctively looks into the fridge. But unfortunately there is nothing there except for water, so disappointed Steven leaves hungry. As soon as he steps inside his house, where do you think does he rush to first? To the fridge, of course. This is the only thing that can make him run. At the same time, his daughter is in Thailand, telling her boyfriend what an amazing person her dad is. Shut up, asshole. My dad's the best. Hey, take it easy. He didn't even get to say a word. Why didn't you tell your dad that I was coming with you? He's jet lost and he envies a man. He can think that girls can date some. While the kids are splashing around in the water and this guy is moving next to the radio, they are surrounded by Thai male chauvinist bandits. In the evening, in Hawaii, one of Seagull's acquaintances drops by to pick up an adult movie disc Stephen had been keeping onto for him. While chatting, this guy delivers some bad news to Stephen about his daughter being kidnapped by Islamic fundamentalists who plan to exchange her for their friends in jail. Steven flies to Thailand without hesitation and happily learns about the changes in the country during his 10 years absence. Girls are the beautiful girls like angels. We have young girls, sexy girls. We have a lot of bars here and not only like massages we do this town. There are also some small downsides, like sometimes vendors in the market can attack you with the knives. But since they fly away themselves, when you wave your hands at them, those attacks are not much danger. After checking in in a hotel, Steven immediately heads to the first trip club recommended by the taxi driver. There he awkwardly swings his arms trying to dance and injures people around. After his extraordinary dancing, he goes to drink with some girls and has a good time after all. At the end of the party, he angrily dismisses a girl's suggestion to switch to a healthy and more balanced diet. Maybe we could get something to eat, something nice. Yeah, but I'm not hungry. Steven returns to the hotel and falls asleep in his street clothes. And I don't know about you, but it used to happen to me in my youth after some wild nights. I'm amazed to see how the next morning the Aikido master found the strength for a motorboat tour. Of course it is a solo tour, since no one dared to sit with him due to the overpowering stench and the risk of sinking the boat. Then he goes to the monastery to flex in front of monks with a couple of phrases that took him a whole morning to learn. Raja, Raja, 
Steven pretends to be an old man to play on Byron's sympathy, telling him how emotionally difficult it is to relax on a beach while his daughter is forced to fight off thugs who provide her with free food and shelter. You have to eat something. I'm not hungry. He can't help us. So there is some CIA agent and this guy is Thai army officer, for some reason living in a museum. They are having some boring and useless conversation about hostages, fantasizing how they will be rescued and um, what the hell is Seagull? Oh, there he is. Forgot his hotel room keys, now trying to break open yet another cardboard door and hitting on a room service mate. Isn't she the girl who's concerned about the Aikido master's success weight? I come to bring you food. Okay, okay. Investments in Steven Seagal's stomach are enough to justify intrusion in his private property. Oh, Byron Mann also shows up in the room. How does everyone know where Seagal stayed? Is it the case that they inquire in the reception desk whether anyone has seen a huge penguin nearby? What are you doing here? Yeah, and where is the food? Steven, I think he came empty-handed. You need to leave here right now. But Byron quickly finds a way out of the situation. He takes Steven to a restaurant to eat. And there he tells in the inside scoop on every visitor. Who's that girl? Her name is Lena. Steven, I have several troubling news for you. With such observance, you risk to get into a very unpleasant situation. Due to the poor service in the restaurant and the action hero's impatience for food, he moves to a nearby table where it is already served. Please, sit down. The fool thinks that Seagull needs permission. Young man, when it comes to chairs, food and women, it's you who should ask for permission from Steven. Who too? And at this point, bro, I remind you that giving a like to the video is one small gesture for you and a big support for me. To all of those who tap likes under the videos on YouTube they liked, my big respect and love. Okay, so Steven heads back to the strip club and regards his friend with contempt. And what that means? He is certain to betray our Buddha, because the Aikido master always knows perfectly well who is good and who is bad in his movies. Fitch lied to you, but Fernand's a deer. A question of the day, why does this girl constantly feed this Hulk? And the second question is, why she is willing to put her life in danger and betray her boss to the first passerby? Especially the passerby like this. Steven is incapable of holding an eye contact or even engaging conversation. Listen, uh... There's something I want you to do for me. Steven sends the young girl to dig through her boss's papers in case he's an idiot and keeps compromising information in his desk in his open office. But it turns out that someone else is an idiot because at the very that moment all the necessary information to advance the plot suddenly pops out of the facts right in front of Ludus' eyes. Yes, I looked up for her name. The next morning Byron Mann and Steven Seagal head to an abandoned depot, where specially trained soldiers are unable to notice a rotund walrus trolling around in pajama. Even so he takes up all of the available space on screen. I, just like you, have no idea who all of those people are, except for Lena, of course. We have already seen Lena. And only Steven Seagal knows who this person is and why his life is crucial for saving his daughter. Therefore, with a precise shot, he forces the sniper to break the boards. The slaughter begins, people twitch and easily break through thick boards. It all looks fun and interesting until Seagull, all dressed up in his pajama and gold, intervenes in the shootout. He doesn't even want to sit in his movies anymore. Shooting while lying down, this is how far it has gone. At the end of the shooting party, while he's trying to quickly get a couple of more frags, a whole group of police officers materializes behind him and Steven gets kicked off the server for invincibility and auto-aiming cheats. The Aikido master is out of breath again watching as his stunt double walks to the nearest chair. And after catching breath and regaining his strength, he starts waving his arms causing the surrounding police officers to scatter. Then with some inexplicable and ridiculous movement, he pulls out a gun and threatens the police station chief without even looking at him. Fortunately for him, a CIA agent happened to pass him by. And as everyone knows, the Thai Ministry of Internal Affairs obediently submits to any non-Asian looking person wearing a suit. And if you think that the agent will receive the gratitude from the great Buddhist after his miraculous rescue, think again. You got something else to say? I won't be here the next time. Lulu returns home and finds her roommate dead. And instead of the police, the Lulu is picked up by Byron Mann and Steven Seagal, taken in an unknown direction, hidden in a cockroach-infested room above a store. This place is safe. As the apartment requires climbing to the second floor, Steven tries to catch his breath while standing, but then he wisely sits down. 
And what happens next looks absurd, weird and disturbing. Well, usually, Steven's bald head is hidden from the camera. In this scene you can clearly see three hairs and a black marker-drawn penguin hat on Steven's head. And yeah, of course, in addition, he violates moral norms by taking advantage of the shock of the girl who has just lost her friend. Oh. No. No. As our shock wears off, we see Byron Mann and Steven driving somewhere, but their way is blocked by a jerk who parks however he wants, so the couple gets out of the car to find the hapless driver, but immediately comes across a pile of corpses. And while they are leisurely walks among the bodies of some people, none other than Lena sits in the car and watches them while driving away. Steven spends some time pondering how Lena manages to look sideways when he sees her directly, even though the car is in the side and in front of them, blocked with piles of boards. But his thought are quickly interrupted by sword dancers who were waiting between the boards for passing tourists to show them a performance. Not for free, of course. And since Siegel forgot his wallet in another pair of pajamas and his friend has been living without an income for 10 years, the dancers get angry and jump on the heroes to punish them for watching for free. That's a bullshit situation because you have to agree on the price before starting to perform. A fight breaks out and, and Byron Mann shows off some martial arts. At the same time, Steven Siegel contorts his face barely shakes his belly and awkwardly waves his hands. After the dancers scattered, Siegel shares his plans for freeing his daughter as soon as possible. Sooner or later they're gonna slip up, and when they do, we'll get what we want. That's... What about taking more proactive stance? I pray they come for me, because then we'll find out where my daughter is. As Steven prays, bandits keeping busy, giving the hostages massages or filming videos for YouTube. Apparently the situation is getting more intense, but Steven doesn't seem to care too much about it. Where are we going? Fitch is all we've got. Besides the strip club owner, there is also an amazing lead in the form of Lena, whom you already encountered twice under suspicious circumstances. I understand, she doesn't own a strip club, so there wouldn't be much hanging around with girls. Though, as I see, the going to a strip club is not that necessary. On the streets, Steven finds a pretty good option. After receiving an excellent service, Steven gets Byron and they rent a boat for another water ride. However, Byron accidentally navigates them to a territory occupied by an army of tough armed guys. Fortunately, the guy whom Steven had saved with his accurate shot among the trains is also living there and Steven wants to discuss with him a question he already knows the answer for. Who's that woman at the train yard? Her name's Lena. Maybe it's time to stop chasing after girls, Steven. Your daughter is being held hostage for the sake of... It's all about the girls. Just here for those girls. But Lena is not a girl. I understand that. And after their boat trip, the friends decide to head to the strip club. But it is still closed at this time of day. And the owner pulls a gun on Steven because he's been getting on everyone's nerve in the club already. With his awesome dancing and hurting people around. Ignoring the gun because such a toy can't penetrate that layer of fat anyway. Steven threatens the guy and comes up with some nonsense on the spot. And, uh, well, so you kidnapped my daughter. What? Where did you get this information from? By lucky coincidence, Lena with the BDSM toys happens to be in the same club. I like this one. I want him. Well, you're not my type, but hey. Bro, I don't want to put you in an awkward position, but let me put it this way. Most likely Lena didn't mean you. To prevent Pudgy Winnie the Pooh from touching him, the ladyboy attacks him with claws. What did he stretch with those? Are you implying that Steven is actually made of cotton wool like a real-life Winnie the Pooh? I liked you much better as a bitch. Are you enjoying it? The fate of the character will now be decided by an insecure, vengeful, self-absorbed, fat guy who considers himself an action movie hero. Rest in peace, bro. Please don't kill him. Sunti, this is not a good man. The important preparation stage begins. In such moments, Van Damme stretches his legs, kicks some trees, Stallone chases after chickens, Arnold does his makeup, Steven Seagal, as usual, is sitting. Listen, I've been thinking. <sighs>
And the moment of truth arrives. Byron 1, the silent sidekick of the main hero, packs all their arsenal while Seagull makes a phone call to his friend. Yeah, yeah. I want two cheapers. I want a biggie fries. I want pickles and ketchup on them. And give me some shit to drink. Hop. Then Steven grabs a pistol with the most crookedly attached silencer and pretends to know sign language. Why you stupid? The friends free the girls from the dungeon and lead them straight to the bullets of the approaching soldiers. But the bullets pass through the fleeing characters, raising a pile of debris on the table behind them. And when soldiers' ammunition runs out, they simply try to crush them with their dead bodies. Sometimes Steven is targeted with those who still have bullets, but he defends himself by shrugging the shoulders in his signature way, which instantly makes him invincible. Then he separates from the main group and instead of running away as fast as possible, the big guy goes to admire the museum exhibits. But the main boss appears, the police or army commander, I don't know who the hell he is, but he's threatening with one of the exhibits in his hands. Goofball, bullets and grenades are no match for Seagull, he can shoot ridiculous ancient arrows from the crooked gun, he can slice them in halves just for fun. The main boss takes hold of another exhibit and leaves himself with no chance trying to defeat Seagull in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is just ridiculous at this point, it is impossible to beat Seagull, and at some point the villain realizes that by himself. But to the luck of the main boss, at the most inconvenient moment, overeating Thai food makes itself felt. Seagull gets a stomachache, so while he is rushing to the bathroom, his stunt double takes his place and I don't know, maybe they should have taken a break or something, because I wanted to see Steven Seagull fight, not this no name. Okay... Okay, bring the no name back. Having waving his hands to his heart's content, a satisfied Steagle joins his team. And it turns out that while he was resting, watching his stuntman at the work, Byron 1 took care of a whole Thai army. But unfortunately, one of the bullets somehow grazed him. Since it is his fault for not raising his shoulders to protect from bullets, Seagull's stunt double now throws his ashes into the nearest ditch. Meanwhile, the sex tourist, the stripper, the American teenager are strolling alone with a procession of monks and elephants. You know, I have a feeling that the filmmakers were trolling Steven Seagal in this movie. Starting with the title, continuing with all these references to refrigerators and food in general, the loud and strongly pronounced shorts of breath. What do you think? Was the director trolling the great master? In general, this movie didn't make me want to curse like I do when working on other videos about his movies. And many moments I laughed out loud. And if you enjoy watching hilariously bad movies and come across Belly of the Beast, I I strongly recommend it for viewing. On my channel I have other video reviews of similar movies. Steven Seagal, the great Neil Breen, maybe a couple of others. But for now, till the next time, cheers.